It is no secret that in an increasingly globalized world, there are challenges that must be addressed through a global response. In an effort to address and find solutions to these problems, G20 world leaders gathered in Rome through October 30th and 31st. Emerging from the meeting was a new Rome Declaration. Some of the key issues underlying the Declaration are COVID-19 and global health, economic recovery, and environmental sustainability. What did the leaders have to say about COVID-19? The G20 meeting reaffirmed the global community's dedication to act as a united front in the face of the pandemic. The nations agreed to strengthen their efforts to help vulnerable countries recover from the pandemic. Particularly, the nations agreed to work together in order to ensure that access to vaccines are inclusive, affordable, safe, and universal. This means that the nations will provide vaccines and medical supplies to developing nations in order to alleviate any financial constraints they may face. This is because, the G20 leaders argue, vaccines remain the best weapon against the pandemic. As a result, the nations are striving towards the goal of vaccinating at least 40% of the world by end of 2021 and 70% by 2022. The Rome Declaration also highlights issues related to the global economy. The report points out that as a result of access to vaccines, the global economy has begun to recover at a slow rate. Nevertheless, recovery has been uneven across the world, where some sectors, communities, and nations are faring better than others. As a result, the nations will avoid withdrawing from internal support structures to better provide the needs of their vulnerable working populations. That is, the declaration recognizes that the pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on migrant workers, women, youth, and low-skilled workers. As a result, the nations agreed to work together to ensure that these vulnerable communities are considering in approaches to pandemic recovery. Moreover, central banks across the nations in the G20 are being monitored, in part, to ensure that inflation remains manageable. Another key topic of discussion at the G20 was the environment. Firstly, the leaders agreed to strengthen their approaches to reversing the loss of biodiversity by 2030. On a voluntary basis, nations will work to reduce degraded land by 50% by 2040. These efforts will include putting measures into place to avoid overfishing and making sustainable use of natural resources. Additionally, efforts to prevent environmental crimes like illegal mining, illegal wildlife trade, illegal disposal of waste and hazardous substances will be strengthened. Moreover, to facilitate the creation of carbon sinks and to reduce land degradation, the nations call for international government and private sector cooperation in their aim to plant one trillion trees around the world by 2030. The nation also called on the private sector, including businesses and academics, as well as the civil society to improve sustainability and resource efficiency within urban city centers. Moreover, in acknowledgement that climate change disproportionately affects the poorest communities across the world, the G20 leaders recommitted to provide 100 billion US dollars annually through 2025 to assist developing countries in their fight against climate change. Additionally, while the G20 leaders also recommitted to the Paris Agreement target of keeping global temperatures 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Some, including the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, were disappointed by the approach the G20 took towards the climate. Particularly, language and the commitments made in the G20 Rome Declaration were deemed weaker than was desirable given the recent reports by the IPCC that warned of the irreversible impact of human activities on the environment. These activities have caused rapidly rising sea levels, heating of oceans, and the rise in surface temperatures across the globe. For example, at the G20 meeting, the goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2050 was replaced by a more vague deadline of the mid-century. Additionally, rather than aiming to eliminate coal power by the late 2030s, the goal in the report was watered down to as soon as possible. At the wrap-up of the G20 conference, many were concerned about the weak foundation that the meeting set for the COP26 conference that was to follow. So what exactly has happened at COP to date? Currently, the United Nations is hosting the 26th COP conference. The meeting began October 31st and will continue until November 12th. COP stands for Conference of the Parties. At COP26, world leaders were involved in a global gathering to negotiate how the international community will confront climate change. This year's COP happened in Glasgow. The first COP took place in Berlin in 1995. Since then, they have taken place every year, exempting last year during COVID-19. The 26th COP conference was an especially pivotal one. 
Why? Well, let's rewind a bit to 2015, COP21. During the 21st COP conference, leaders negotiated and agreed upon something called the Paris Accord. Several long-term goals were outlined in the agreement. Firstly, countries agreed to reduce gas emissions to keep the global temperatures well below 2 degrees Celsius. Moreover, if possible, to keep it below 1.5 degrees Celsius. This temperature represents the global average that has been rising quickly over the last decade. Next, developed countries were to provide funding to developing countries to alleviate the effects of climate change. Finally, countries would review their progress collectively every five years. According to the UN, the agreement was a legally binding one. The plan, outlined in the Paris Accord, was to increase the goals for climate action at each five-year review. The COP26 was the first review, five years after the Paris Agreement was signed. And how did the world do? Well, according to the Climate Action Tracker, India and Kenya were countries which rejected accountability regarding climate goals. However, they were still on track with these goals, to limit global warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. In contrast, Canada committed to the 2 degrees Celsius ambition, but their policies suggest that they are in line with 4 degrees Celsius by 2030. Additionally, the UK and South Africa seem to be headed towards achieving the 2 degrees Celsius goal, while the US and Japan look like they will miss it. Meanwhile, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Morocco, Gambia, Kenya, Costa Rica, and Nepal are on track towards achieving the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal. The goal of 2 degrees Celsius was selected because it seemed the most obtainable. However, what kind of impact will the world see at a global average temperature of 2 degrees Celsius? Although the number does not seem like a big deal, a world which is 2 degrees warmer is a massive transformation for all living beings on Earth. This increase would not mean that everywhere on the planet will be 2 degrees warmer. Instead, it means that some places will be much hotter, others will be the same as today, and some might be even cooler. Therefore, the predictions for each region will vary. Heat waves will become common occurrences across the globe. Scientists anticipate that they will affect around 40% of the human population. These conditions could become deadly for cities with already hot and humid climates. Additionally, glaciers across the world will likely melt rapidly. This means that water levels will rise and that could flood coastal cities. Additionally, those cities which aren't completely drowned could still see floods during storms and high tides. Not only does this affect humans and infrastructure, this can also have devastating effects on wildlife living in areas where floods would be more common. To make matters worse, most research suggests that extremes will only become more extreme. So, for example, storms and monsoon rains can be expected to worsen. Meanwhile, droughts in between will also become longer. Therefore, water scarcity could become an even more threatening world issue. So, in short, a world which has an average global temperature of 2 degrees Celsius would be a world where food and water become harder to obtain, a world where storms can be expected to worsen, where droughts and heat waves will become more common, and many more frightening consequences. While the world moves towards renewable energy, the resulting drop in demand for oil and gas could hit the economy hard, if not properly managed. Because of the push towards achieving net zero emissions by 2050, renewable energy will become more efficient, cheaper, and stable. Many carbon assets will lose their value, and those who are making money from these could face hardship. So far, this year's COP saw the international community agreeing to halt and reverse deforestation by 2030, saw every G7 nation commit to stopping international coal financing by the end of this year, and 77 countries agreed to phase out coal altogether by the 2030s and 2040s. Despite the promises and signatures, we should not jump for joy yet. Indeed, many scientists and activists are urging policy and practice to follow through on the commitments made at this year's conference. Moreover, the conference is still ongoing, so we'll have to wait and see what global leaders will say and do about the threatening climate crisis looming ahead.